Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the BC Provincial Effective Speaking Competition. My name is Jermaine Chu and I am the BC Effective Speaking Coordinator. Six hours ago was the start of Prince Philip's funeral. I would like us to commemorate Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh, with a minute of silence. Thank you. We will now begin our BC Effective Speaking Competition. I am excited today as we have eight cadets competing at this provincial competition at Eight Wings. We have a few housekeeping rules to cover. Out of respect to the speakers, judges, and audience, we ask that you are muted during competition. I would like to remind that no photography, screenshots are to be taken during the competition. At the end of competition, we will have a chance to take photos and screenshots. The competition is now recorded and the videos will be posted on the BCPC website once approved. Please decide prior to speech beginning if you would like your video on or off. Once the speech begins, please do not switch or move about as speech is in progress. We will monitor the audio and visual while the speech is underway. Once this meeting has been announced as beginning, those entering late will be admitted in between speeches. The format for today is as follows. Each speaker will present a five to six minute speech, prepared speech with a two minute break for judges to mark. We ask for your cooperation in keeping your systems muted while our judges score. After all prepared speeches are complete, we will have the judges email their marks to the designated email addresses. We will then have a 15 minute break, then, in, then commence the impromptu section of competition. Impromptu speeches will be two to three minutes each and will be presented in reverse order. The speaker will not know the topic of the speech until they are given three minutes to prepare prior to their turn. After the completion of the speeches, we will tally the scores and then announce the top three names. The gold medalists will continue on to the national competition, which is held on June 5th on Zoom with details to follow. And here is the sequence of events that was just displayed. Let's start this competition and have some fun. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, it is my privilege to introduce to you speaker one. Diversity, diversity, speaker one. The term diversity has come to have a significant role in the lives of thousands of people. Whether it be in gender, race, or sexual orientation, being different is simply the new normal. But it wasn't always that way. In Canada, at a young age, we are taught that our country used to treat these differences as if they were the plague, with an uncalled mindset fearing change. Much has developed since then, and this generation is continuously pushing forward for the acceptance of change and differences. This is the meaning of diversity. We see it happening around the world, fueled by the young people of today. 
events such as, such as support for the LGBTQ community, missing or murdered indigenous women and girls, and the death of George Floyd. All of these events are happening. And the difference is that we are fighting even harder for the acceptance of diversity. The LGBTQ community has been around for generations, but it was only in 2005 when they finally began to gain rights for same-sex marriage. This decision was not made by the free will of the people in power. It was made by the pressuring of thousands of Canadians who refused to be ashamed of their differences from society. There is a reason that the celebration of these rights becoming legalized is called the Pride Parade. Acceptance has grown significantly within our community. It is shown in public places such as schools, recreational centers, and neighborhoods. And of course, the most effective areas on entertainment and social media. This community is slowly growing to be consider considered normal by most people. But it is not finished yet. It's a welcome change to those looking to find their place. Unfortunately, not every battle in the acceptance of diversity has been completely won. A particular issue has grown in its awareness for Canadians. I myself only found out about this through social media, and I'm disgusted that I was not shown about this in my own education system. From 2001 to 2014, the average rate of homicides involving non-Indigenous female victims was four times higher than of the homicides involving Indigenous female victims. And the justice system is to blame for these fatal reports. And they are fully aware of it. To this day, the safety, security, and dignity of mothers, daughters, sisters, and friends are routinely threatened. Time and again, we have seen and heard of their disappearance, violence, or even death being labeled as a low priority or ignored. This was Prime Minister Justin Trudeau's remarks for the national inquiry when being asked about the issue. On February 14th, an annual memorial in March is held every year in Vancouver in recognition and to protest the neglect of people based on their cultural backgrounds. They do this as a, as a reminder that there is much left to be looked into. Similarly, in 2020, the death of George Floyd, a Black man who was killed after a police officer knelt on his neck for nine and a half minutes. Before the video and the story of the arrest was made public, the officer's unspeakable actions were dismissed. This sparked international outrage at the government and the justice system. Protests began on May 26, 2020, and by June 6, an, an estimated half a million joined within the United States to eventually grow to over 60 countries in support of Black Lives Matter movement. With the protests growing, so did the pressure on the injustice of police brutality, police racism, and lack of police accountability. This one event showed light on something that had been swept under the under the rug for years. Many other people of color who were abused in similar situations took it upon the opportunity to speak up about their own experiences. At the end of the day, it is so important to remember that all these people want is to be treated equally, no matter what their race is. I never my, imagined myself to be organizing an anti-racism project for my last year of high school. And along with that, I never thought that I would grow to be so passionate about it when it came to dealing with this topic. But it was these events that encouraged me to do so, to make sure that my voice was heard. And as I was writing the speech and working on my school project, I realized that the meaning of diversity isn't just a simple definition of recognizing our individual differences. To me, diversity is about the fight and the hard work that got us to that recognition, the enlightenment and justice that was brought to those who were murdered. All of these events 
are just the beginning. And it's time that we take responsibility to fight for diversity within our own communities and within our own country. Madam Chair. Thank you, Speaker One. And two minutes for our judges, please. Next, we have Speaker Two, Cadet Choice, Science and Technology, Rockets. How hard are they? How hard can they be? Cadet Choice, Science and Technology, Rockets. How hard can they be? Speaker Two. Hello, Madam Chair, judges, esteemed esteemed guests. Cadets, all. As a young child, I'd always look up to the night sky and ponder. Ponder how do we get there, into space, to the planets and stars. That question has stuck with me since then and has manifested an interest in me, in rockets. From there on, I've made it my goal to understand all that I can about rockets, physics, and chemical reactions. I'd explore online, talk to amateur rocketeers and teachers, and even look through textbooks. Building off of that, in recent endeavors, I have finally been able to put that knowledge juice as I attempt to manufacture a successful rocket, my very own rocket. Building a rocket is a definite challenge, both a goal in mind and a set question to answer, it is possible. My goal and question are to explore how difficult it is to research, build, and send a rocket to one kilometer. Explored now is that answer. Research makes up the bulk of any project. Learning what you have to do before you do it is an absolute necessity. Without that knowledge, chances are something will go wrong. In the case of rocketry, researching and understanding are your best friends in making a successful rocket. At the beginning of my rocket endeavors, I had a very different idea of how my rocket should look. I planned on using a mixture of powdered aluminum and water as my fuel, an experimental mixture called ALICE. Thankfully, as a result of research, I learned that powdered aluminum is illegal in Canada. So I had to change that up. Looking for inspiration, I talked to one of my childhood heroes, a brilliant scientist who pretty much runs the Okanagan Science Center. There he suggested the use of a different fuel combination, potassium nitrate and dextrose. There he also taught me rocket design, engine manufacturing, fuel loading, and recovery systems. With some more finalization of the rocket, getting a hold of materials and contacting officials to okay the project, all was set forth for me to start the building process. When building a rocket comes to mind, one tends to think of it as such a difficult task. Honestly, it is hard to manufacture a rocket. But if you break the work up into smaller pieces for each portion of it, it does get easier. With some assistance from my school shop teacher, I was able to start the rocket building process. The first step of which was to engineer the rocket's nozzle, the hardest step in the rocket process. The learning curve for this portion was very steep, but achievable. After 12 hours of on and off work, taking my lunch hours to do so, I completed the rocket nozzle and boy was I proud. From there, it was relatively easy. Finishing the engine, cutting PVC pipe, slicing up aluminum sheet, spinning a wooden nose cone, making launch guidance, making a recovery system, then putting it all together into one single rocket. Without out of the way, comes the fun part, testing and launching. With any multi-million dollar rocket, rigorous testing of each component, big or small, needs to occur. These tests are to ensure the rocket will work perfectly, just as intended. And that's what I did. There are three main tests I wanted to perform on my rocket to make sure it would work smoothly. The first was to test the engine, followed by the engine mount, and then the recovery system. These tests work hand in hand with each other to tell me the rocket will work. The first test, the engine, was the most entertaining and loud of the tests. The engine was mounted to a table upright and ignited. And after ignition, I was glad to see it worked out perfectly, finishing its burn in one piece. The next test was the engine to make sure that the rocket would hold the engine in place in flight. And the final was to test the recovery system 
to make sure the rocket would deploy its recovery, deploy its parachute at altitude and recover safely, come back home. With all the tests completed and succeeded comes the final portion of this experience, the launch. Now, the rocket hasn't been launched just yet, but all is set and ready for the epic finale. And even with the rocket not launched, there have been many things I've learned through this rocket experience. Patience, prowess, positivity, and dedication. Each step in the rocket process has been an educated leap of faith. And with each of those leaps, have there been many challenges to conquer as well? The biggest of which with the nozzle machining process. Though this endeavor has been six months in the making, it has been worth the long wait. And I expect, fingers crossed, a full success and a final height of close to one kilometer. But only the launch will tell. I've been documenting the whole process. Keep an eye on the news. You might just see something. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Speaker Two. And two minutes for our judges, please. Next, we have Speaker Three. What can you do to be a good environmental steward? What can you do to be a good environmental steward? Speaker Three. I closed my eyes as the wind ran its cool hands through the soft strands of my hair. I could feel the heat of the sun shining upon my cheek like a happy memory. This peace, this silence, I could bathe in it forever. I stood on the ridge of a local mountain that led to a lake. I opened my eyes to look at my family members standing a few hundred meters ahead of me under the vast, impossibly blue sky. All around me were beautiful slabs of stone and pieces of shale intertwined with patches of moss, lichen and grass to form a picturesque view. And I thought this must be a painting. I can remember thinking about how grateful I was that I was able to experience that moment. The calming sight, melodic sounds, fresh smells, and pure feeling of elation and harmony. Even years later, I vividly remember experiences such as this one. Having the environment in my life has come to shape me as a person, making me more self-aware calmer, caring, and so much more. This is why when I see someone throwing an old soda cup from the drive-thru out their window or stomping out a cigarette butt in the grass, I'm not only saddened, but scared. We are all a community and our actions matter. Each small action adds up to create larger common problems. And slowly, our environment becomes compromised. How much would it impact future generations to come, or maybe even our own, in the next couple of decades, if we do not care for the environment? I do not want humanity to lose our appreciation for the beauty of Mother Nature, and I hope you feel the same. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, judges, officers, and fellow cadets. I'm Sergeant Patrick from the 396 City of Prince George, Royal Canadian Air Cadet Squadron. And this is what you can do to be a good environmental steward. Being a good environmental steward is actually pretty simple. All you need to do to be a good environmental steward is be respectful of the environment be conscientious of your surroundings and be aware of the impact humans can have in both negative and positive ways. In fact, I have already made changes and seen other people in my community engage in environmental practices. Here are some great examples of these environmentally beneficial actions. Personally, I go hiking and camping a ton with my family. Whenever we are out, 
we bring a spare garbage bag and pick up any trash that we find laying around. We also try not to contribute to noise pollution and ensure campfires are fully put out. So we do not start forest fires. There are things that I also do when I'm at cadet field training exercises, commonly known as FTXs, which are short outings where cadets are able to learn and further develop survivor skills in the wilderness. During these trips, we always perform a foreign object debris or FOD walk. Cadets stand in a line and slowly walk back and forth along the area we have been staying in, scanning the ground and ensuring that we have not left any traces that we have been there. This lessens our impact on the area and allows us to return in the future. My sister also did her part when her gymnastics club participated in a highway cleanup for fundraising and to give back to the community. Finding organizations that are involved with things like this or encouraging groups you're already a part of to participate in events such as these is a great way to keep the environment clean. These are just a few of the things that everyone can participate or promote to be a good environmental steward. Every action, no matter how small, contributes to environmental stewardship. And there are many other ways you can be a good environmental steward too. These small actions cannot only lead to big changes, but inspire great ideas. It is important to be a good environmental steward so that we can preserve the natural balance of the land and its wildlife for generations to come. You can be a good environmental steward by simply following the three R's, reduce, reuse, recycle, and being an active participant to inspire positive change. Thank you. Thank you, speaker three. And two minutes for our judges, please. Next, we have speaker four, a Canadian hero, a Canadian hero, speaker four. Hello judges, fellow cadets, and guests. Today I'll be talking about a Canadian hero and the impact that they made on our society. My Canadian hero is Tommy Prince. Tommy Prince was born in a canvas tent in Petersfield, Manitoba on October 25th, 1915. Prince was one of Canada's most decorated First Nations soldiers, honored with 11 medals. Prince enlisted in the army in 1940 being put to work as a sapper in the first field park company of the Royal Canadian Engineers. A sapper, which is more commonly known as a pioneer, does many tasks, including digging the trenches and refilling, refilling the ammo boxes. After being posted to the first Canadian service platoon, a select group of soldiers sent to train with an American unit to form a specialized assault team. They became the first special service force known to the enemy as the Devil's Brigade. Prince distinguished himself with the first special service force in Italy and France using the skills he learned from growing up on a farm with his dad. He had shown off his covert abilities in a celebrated action near the front line of Anzio, Italy. In February, 1944, he volunteered to run a communication line nearly 1,400 meters to an abandoned farmhouse there was about there was only 200 meters, about twice the length of a football field from a German artillery post. When the wire was severed during shelling, he disguised himself as a peasant, far, as a peasant farmer and pretended to work the land around the farmhouse. He stopped the tie his shoe and fixed the wire while German soldiers watched, oblivious to his true identity. At one point, he shook his fist at the Germans and then at the Allies, pretending to be disgusted with both of them. His actions resulted in the destruction of four German tanks that had been firing on Allied troops. When the fighting ended in France, Prince was summoned to Buckingham Palace, where King George VI decorated him with the military medal. And on behalf of the American president, the Silver Star with ribbon. He would also receive the 1939 to 1945 star the Italy star, the France and Germany star, the defense medal, 
and the Canadian Volunteer Service Medal with clasps. He also later on received the War Medal. Prince was one of 59 Canadians who were awarded the Silver Star during the Second World War, only three of whom also possessed the military medal. Prince was honorably discharged on the 15th of June, 1945 and returned to Canada. At home, Prince faced racism and discrimination from the Canadian government. As an Indigenous man, he was not allowed to vote in federal elections despite his wartime service and was refused the same benefits as other Canadian veterans. He started a business which briefly prospered. He left it in the hands of friends so he could serve as a spokesman for the Manitobian Indian Association where he lobbied the federal government to change the Indian Act. Following his campaigning, he came home to discover that the business he'd entrusted to his friends had failed in his absence. Prince has a, had a strong sense of civic duty and a fierce pride in his people. He dedicated himself to attaining increased educational and op economic opportunities for indigenous peoples. All of my life, I had wanted to do something to help my people recover their good name. I wanted to show they were as Good as any white man, he had said. He was married and had five children. In 1955, he saw men drowning at the Alexander docks in Winnipeg and even decided to leap in to save him from death. Facing unemployment and discrimination, he re enlisted in the military and served with the Princess Patricia's Canadian Light Infantry. Prince later came back to the army, resuming his rank and began training new recruits. The Korean War. He was part of the first Canadian unit to land in Korea, where he served with the PPCLI rifle platoon. Suffering from bad knees, Prince returned to Canada for treatment in 1951, but he went back to Korea for a second tour in 1952. He was injured again and spent weeks in hospital where he was still recovering when the Korea armistice came into force in 1953, ending the fighting. Prince fell in challenging times and spent his last years living in a Salvation Army shelter. He died at the Red Tier Lodge in Hospital in Winnipeg on the 25th of November, 1977. He was 62. There is now a petition to put Prince on the $5 bill, which I have personally signed, and I believe if you're up to the task, you should do. The name, the did you know, the name to the Devil's Brigade was adopted by Hollywood as the title of a 1968 portrayal of the light unit. Prince was portrayed as the character chief. Thank you, back to you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Speaker Four. And two minutes for our judges, please. Moving along, we have Speaker Five. Describe a historic event and what it meant to Canada. Describe an historic event and what it meant to Canada. Speaker Five. There are so many historical events that define our country. Events that have such a big impact on Canada, we learn about them now in our classrooms. These experiences of our country define not only Canada, but also reflect on us all as Canadian citizens. One of the biggest issues of our path we're still trying to make right is residential schools. Let's take ourselves back, back to the year 1831. This was the year the first residential school in Canada was established. In Brantford, Ontario, the Mohawk Institute was erected for Indian children from the ages four to 16. Can you even imagine being taken away from your family at four years of age? Because I certainly can't. This happened to over 150,000 First Nations children who were then tormented to the breaking point just for being born. Out of those 150,000, there are only 80,000 residential school survivors. One of those survivors is named Edmund Matatawabin. Edmund's father dropped him off at St. Anne's Residential School in 1956, when he was only seven years old. He would be the first of 10 siblings to attend that school. His first impression of St. Anne's was a vicious slap across the face. Students were hit by hand or with objects. The smallest of things, or sometimes for no reason at all. And it only got worse. At one point, Edmund was so sick of the vile food they were being fed that he vomited on his fourth day. 
One sister saw this and sent him to his room to be isolated with no food for three days. After his punishment, the first meal he was given was his onion porridge, which contained his residue vomit from three days earlier. He ate his already half-eaten food for fear of punishment far worse than three-day isolation. Another barbaric punishment used at St. Anne's was a homemade electric chair. The brothers and sisters would put the students in the chairs for not only punishment, but also entertainment. They would laugh and laugh while these children were in immense pain for their amusement. And yet, despite the despicable things he went through, Edmund overcame them and went on to go to university and even became chief before Albany First Nation. He organized a conference for the survivors of St. Anne's residential school in 1992 because he recognized the suffering of his people and thought it was time for them to tell their sides of the story. Their brave accounts formed the base of a five-year-long provincial-wide police investigation. Out of the investigation came trials and several convictions of former staff and supervisors, including, including the nun who made Edmund eat his own vomit. So many survivors have gone through similar experiences. Rachel Chalkas remembers that the first thing that happened to her at residential schools was remaking her image. They took their clothes and cut their hair. Lydia Ross re remembers how at residential schools, she didn't even have a name. She had numbers. Daniel Nanich remembers being separated from the siblings. Beverly Ann Michelle remembers how even after two of her brothers committed suicide at school, she still wasn't allowed to talk to her sister. Marcel Gibach remembers how when students didn't understand a brother or sister speaking English, they were beaten. And when they cried, more violence ensued. Vitaline Elsie Jenner remembers strict patriarchal attitudes towards girls that instilled a sense of shame in those girls growing up in residential schools. These are just a small fraction of the people who went through the horrors of residential schools. Edmund, in a statement to the press, saying, All we want is justice. All we want is movement that will make me feel, oh, finally it's over. Finally, it's over. They believe me. That is what we, as Canadians, should be moving towards. Reconciling the horrors of our past and getting over the hurdles in our history to become a strong, cohesive Canada instead of broken individuals who live on this land. Residential school has played a huge part in our history. In fact, it's one of the things that made us the country we are today. And we can learn from these past mistakes to make sure we never repeat them in the future, to make sure no one has to be hurt again. Canada's past isn't perfect, but Canadians together can make sure that people like Edmund Matatuabin, people like Rachel Chalkasim, and people like Lydia Ross never have to suffer the way they did. And only in doing that can we, can we move together towards a brighter and better future. Back to you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Speaker Five. And two minutes for our judges, please. Next, we have Speaker Six. What does diversity mean to you? What does diversity mean to you? Speaker Six. As I walk the halls of my school, I see many unique faces. They come from a multitude of ethnic backgrounds, of cultures, and every day, I am amazed by the diversity of Canada. Good afternoon, judges, fellow cadets, and guests. Today, I want to share with you what diversity means to me. We'll be exploring the topics of diversity in Canada, our biases and stereotypes, and finally, influential social movements that have defined our past year. Now, diversity by textbook definition is the practice of involving people from a range of different backgrounds, including ethnicity, race, gender, and sexual orientation. And in a country as culturally diverse as Canada, many people get to experience this firsthand. In the 2016 Canadian census, 22.3% of the population was composed of visible minority groups, with the top five largest being South Asian, Chinese, Black, Filipino, and Latin American. The other 77.7% .7 is a mix of European and First Nations people. 
Now with such a wide array of groups, diversity in Canada allows us to experience cultures from across the globe. Pretty amazing, right? To put this in perspective, I speak French with my friend from France. I learn about Ramadan from an Egyptian friend and I try Ethiopian food with my friend from Ethiopia. In return, I share my Chinese heritage. These unique experiences are a direct result of Canada's ethnic mosaic. Yet a fellow cadet I met at a national summer course from a small town in Ontario experiences a different type of diversity. In her town, the majority of citizens are Caucasian. So while I may experience an abundance of cultural diversity, this experience is not replicated for all Canadians. However, diversity presents itself in many ways. So even in my friend's small town, diversity in the form of sexual orientations or gender rather than culture finds its way to trickle in. And while we're speaking of diversity and what it truly means, it's important to recognize within ourselves the biases and stereotypes we may hold. A bias is defined as a prejudice in favor of or against a group. And a stereotype is how we associate certain traits to a group of people. Let me provide you with an example of bias, where an experienced and knowledgeable young woman applies at a STEM company, but is rejected for the company favors hiring men over women. Whereas a scenario for stereotyping could be when a black teen enters a store and is tailed by security, for they associate them with stealing. These biases and stereotypes can work to impair diversity, giving room to misunderstandings and creating space for hatred, or worse, violence. Often the reason these presumptions arise can be simplified to one thing, a lack of exposure. Let's think back to the example of my friend in her town in Ontario. Without firsthand experience with people from various cultures, her only contact with them may be through social media. However, with the media, people can fail to recognize the biases and stereotypes presented, taking false statements regarding other groups to be true. Therefore, me, you, everyone who is exposed to the media, it's important to actively engage in eliminating our own prejudice through interacting with people different from us or doing thorough research from reliable sources. Together, we can consciously eliminate animosity towards groups unfamiliar to us and begin to appreciate the Canadian gift that is diversity. Unfortunately, throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, acts of violence and hatred have manifested in our news, our cities, perhaps even our own neighborhoods. Anti-Asian hate crimes are surging in Canada during the pandemic. In reports released by police departments across the country, Asian hate crimes have risen since 2019 by 717% in Vancouver, 600% in Ottawa, and have seen dramatic increases in other major cities, including Toronto and Montreal. These statistics are alarming to say the least. For me, as a person of Chinese descent with parents and grandparents here in Canada, I am afraid, afraid of what this means for my family, for my Asian friends and the danger this creates. However, with social movements like Stop Asian Hate and Black Lives Matter, we courageously take a stand against those who choose not to understand nor accept diversity. We can hope that our futures help, help generations cherish Canada's diversity. In the end, Diversity to me means being unique yet belonging. It's the beauty of our country, a collection of languages, folklore, food, art, history, genders, perspectives, and more. It's the power each one of us holds to come together as a community despite our differences. And I hope that each one of you in the audience today can harness that power to spread kindness. By celebrating Canada's diversity, we can come to recognize the biases and stereotypes we possess and take action through social movements to overcome these barriers. The landscape of the world holds immense beauty, each one of us a single flower blooming amongst the fields. Our leaves may be of different shapes, our petals of different colors, but below the surface, our roots are all connected. Back to you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Speaker Six. And two minutes for our judges. Next, we have Speaker Seven. Cadet Choice, Science and Technology. Cadet Choice, Science and Technology. Speaker Seven. One second has passed since I started speaking the sentence. Now two, 
and now three. I could tell you that 10 minutes have already passed from the beginning of my first word. But of course, that wouldn't be in my favor. Madam Chair, Ranking Officers, Honorable Guests and Fellow Cadets, 2020 has made us question how we experience time. How is it that baking sour bread can make time go faster while sitting at your desk at school makes you wish you were baking sour bread in quarantine? The answer to this question is simple, but like 2020, a little odd. What if I told you that time doesn't exist? Time is relative. It's only worth depends on what you do as it is passing. Albert Einstein said this, and for a guy that spent the last 20 years of his life trying to combine two math equations, we better hope he believed it. This brings me to my first point. Time is nothing but a social construct. If the world is composed of physical matter, which already have states of their own, solid, liquid, and gas, then what they do, the amount of energy they have, is what defines how we see time. If something has a lot of energy, then they move quickly or move a greater distance over a shorter amount of time. If something doesn't have much energy, then they're kind of slow, much like a student after a math exam. Now you might ask, so what? We already know that some things are fast, some are slow, but then what makes a second a second? This brings me to my second point. Picture this. If on planet Earth, a second was a second, an alien life form like Yoda might experience 20 Yoda seconds before we experience one. And the issue with this is that we have nothing to prove a second ever passes by. So we assume that time itself is constant. For those of you that love science, you might argue Einstein himself said that this isn't true. Time can be dilated, bent, twisted with space. And we don't have to listen to a 15 year old who somehow manages to make it down to dinner an hour late for proof. What Einstein did was explore the relativity of movement on a larger scale, comparing the energy needed for one twin to traverse the solar system to another twin that was passing her time eating Cheetos, watching Netflix back on earth. We can only observe objects, so what the objects themselves do is what matters. So we can see a second is never really just a second, but the amount of energy in each separate object. A human doesn't live on average 70 years. They live until their body can no longer produce the energy. This brings me to my final point. How does this affect us humans? I don't mean to lead you on to believing that you can come to your next interview one hour late or wake up at 3 p.m. claiming, well, it's 7 a.m. in my time, but to put things into perspective. Time moves slower in a fast moving vehicle. This quote shows that the more energy you have, the more passionate you are about something, the more you can do in human earth seconds and just the right amount in your seconds. This is important for those of us that work in companies or have the unfortunate position of being in a group project. The total time it takes for a product to be completed and passed through every single person, how many seconds are in an hour or how many hours are in a day. Instead, it requires a certain level of total energy from the entire team. Give it your all and the more time you have in life. How does this affect our progress into a world of technology? Take what Einstein said, the distinction between past, present, and future is merely a stubbornly persistent illusion. I guess that's what helped him get a consistent 10 hours of sleep every night, or in other words, seven more hours than the average high school student. Taking time out of the equation makes a world of a difference and ironically might have helped Einstein cut down on the 20 years he spent trying to unite quantum theory and the theory of relativity. 
an electron moves 2 million, 200,000 meters a second, while we on our best days might move one. Time prevents us from taking what is small, like quarks and gluons, and blowing it up to the scale of our universe. We don't pass the time, we just exist. There is no past or future. Everything exists all at once in the present. We, our atoms don't die, we just pass through different phases of energy. So now, Madam Chair, Ranking Officers, Honorable Guests, and Fellow Cadets, I ask you, what time is it? Madam Chair. Thank you, Speaker Seven. And two minutes for our judges. Next, we have Speaker Eight. The purpose of diversity. The purpose of diversity. Speaker Eight. Sorry, I have to pin the video. I totally forgot to do that. Okay. When Charles Darwin navigated the Galapagos Islands in 1835, he took a very particular interest in the beaks of the resident birds. The finches that lived in areas where they mostly preyed upon large seeds had wide and thick, tough beaks, while the same finches that preyed upon small insects had thinner and sharper beaks that were perfect for puncturing into trees. These findings led Darwin to bring an intriguing theory to the world. The theory of evolution believes that all species are related and are gradually changing over time. We as humans are inherently different, and after many centuries of growing to be so, our variety has become one of our greatest sources of strength. Hi, my name is Matthew Douglas, Warrant Officer Second Class from 858 Skookum Chuck Squadron, and I am so excited to talk to you all about the purpose and power of diversity. On a biological level, Life itself's goal is to simply continue existing. This means that we have to adapt to the situations that we are given. When we as a species first began to shed the hair that covered our bodies, our skin reacted to the sun. In areas with mo more sun, we developed darker skin to absorb the UV rays, and light skin came from less sun exposure. This is evolution. Everything about who we are has been developing and improving since the start of life. Yet more and more problems are arising with our differences. There's an ideal body type, and those who don't fit into its very certain specific classifications feel self-conscious about how they look. As Speaker One stated, over the summer, there were protests calling out the mistreatment of people with darker skin because there's something wrong with having a different skin pigment. The thing is, we're not really worried about how we look. We're worried about how we will be perceived by others, how they will act in accordance with those perceptions. As an example of perceptions, let's look at Romeo and Juliet. We know that they came from two warring families, the Capulets and the Montagues, but where did this absolute hatred come from? As the reader or the audience, we never really learn. But after the very first scene, which was a massive street brawl, we see that there was a great detestation between the opposing families. Yet while at a masquerade, Romeo and Juliet met and fell in love without the knowledge of the other surnames. When a Capulet saw Montague, or vice versa, there was an instant antagonism. But when a human saw another human, there was a blank slate it turned into one of the greatest fictional loves of all time. How do we label others when trying to perceive the world around us? How do we look at race or religion or sexuality or gender or age or disabilities? There have been residential schools in Canada whose abhorrent goal was to kill the Indian and the child. And the last school was closed in 1996, which was only 25 years ago. It was illegal for two people of the same sex to be married in British Columbia until 2003. Many people don't have the basic ability to feel comfortable with who they are because others decide to brand them as different and therefore unworthy. So where does this global division come from? 
It comes from the universal sensation that we have all felt since the monster underneath our beds. Fear. PsychologyToday.com recognizes fear as that feeling of dread of the unknown, or expectation of danger. Now, I'm not saying that fear is some horrible thing. No, no, no. Fear tells us when not to pet a hungry tiger. Or fear tells us when not to use the parachute that we found in the clearance section. Fear has been a necessary part of the survival of the human race. But when our fear begins to form from false information or stereotypes, we begin to take a step back in the evolutionary process. When one is convinced that one is to fear those that are different from oneself, one holds even tighter to one to those that are similar to oneself. This creates division. Empathy is to see another situation and to think how you would be in the same spot, to put yourself into another's shoes. When humans divide, we begin to have a harder time feeling that empathy for others. We are prone to fear the unknown and to avoid or refrain from joining and the labels of us and them arise, which can potentially cause even more fear. Overcoming the fear of diversity can lead to a healthier humanity. We are more likely to be exposed to new ways of thinking and new ideas. People who are different from one another in race or gender or other dimensions bring unique information and experiences to bear on the situation at hand. People are more able to be comfortable with who they are, and you don't need to be afraid of your own identity. On family day weekend, my family and I went snowshoeing up Dakota Ridge on the Sunshine Coast where I live. It was phenomenal just to stand and watch the snow fall. How each piece, each flake was so peculiar and completely original. But when you looked at the ground, all you saw was one unified mass. As more flakes fell, they simply joined the accumulation with great ease. Nature has the right idea. <laughs> of course it should. It's had 4.543 billion years to master accepting diversity. Now it's our turn. Thank you very much. Thank you, Speaker 8. And two minutes for our judges. All right, there. I just end up cutting the, the judges' marking uh, short just by a minute there. Thank you, Judge One. Uh, but we are going to, that was our uh, last speaker, and we will be going into a uh, 15 minute break. So uh, I will be sharing some screens here, but you are welcome to turn your screens off and grab a coffee and come back and join us at about 226. Judges, uh, tech support, can I have the judges moved into a briefing room as I have a few questions for them and they can also take that time to email their marks to the tally people. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen and esteemed guests, league representatives and national um, coordinators, uh, officers and SSCs, welcome back. We are going to be uh, giving you an idea of what to expect for the impromptu section of competition. Our cadet is presently in the impromptu now receiving their impromptu question and the three minutes for them to collect their thoughts and prepare for a two to three minute speech. Then there'll be two minutes for our judges to mark and then uh, the following cadets will come out. For impromptu section of competition, it is a two to three minute speech with two minutes for judges to mark and will be presented in reverse order. So starting from our last speaker, speaker eight will come out and present. And speaker eight is with us now. Speaker eight, the impromptu question is, if you had to lose one sense, sight, smell, hearing, touch or taste, which would it be? Speaker eight. When I'm scrolling through social media, I'm seeing the perfection of people. I'm seeing the guys with their six packs. I'm seeing everybody with their perfect shapes. I'm seeing everybody with a perfect hair. Everybody looks so perfect. How do you think that makes me feel about how I look myself? I'm sure this is very relatable for everyone. If you look at movies, you look at the Avengers, like, oh my gosh, I wish I had a body like Thor, or I wish I had a body like Captain America. There is a perfect body, and it's so hard for so many people to find it. This is why 
if I were to lose any of my senses, I would lose a sense of taste. Hi, my name is Warren Officer Second Class Matthew Douglas. I'm going to go on a little bit more into that topic right now. My first question to the audience is who likes broccoli? The next question is who likes ice cream? From my guesses is that the second question has a lot more answers and you might think well why do I prefer ice cream to broccoli? Simple answer, it tastes really good. When I was a younger kid I was a bit of a bigger child. I, I was, yeah, I, I was a big kid, and I had a really hard time with that. I'd look around at all these other these other skinny kids running around all over the place, and I thought, I like that, but I like ice cream more. There are people all over the world who have the same thoughts as me. When you get older, it's just so much harder. Your metabolism is breaking down, and you still want to enjoy life. You still want to enjoy eating, but at the same time, it's not that simple. If I were to lose my taste, it'd be a lot more easy and simple for me to lose weight. Because I wouldn't care if I were eating ice cream or eating broccoli or eating, I don't know, Brussels sprouts. I'm sorry, all you Brussels sprouts lovers. I'm not one of you. But it wouldn't matter to me. And I probably would be in some of the best shape of my entire life. And I would like that. I still want to be able to watch the sunset. I still want to be able to listen to the birds chirping as I wake up in bed. I still want to be able to feel the hug of my mom every time I come home. But the taste of Brussels sprouts and the taste of ice cream, I can do without that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Speaker 8. And two minutes for our judges. Speaker 7, your impromptu question is, if you had to lose one cent, sight, smell, hearing, touch, or taste, which would it be? Speaker seven. A thousand years ago, humans began to use their senses for good. They discovered, innovated, created, built things. They advanced technology to a point where the next question is not if, but when. Come 2021, I ask to the human race, what happened? Madam Chair, Ranking Officers, Honorable Guests, and Fellow Cadets. Throughout history, humans have made choices. My biology teacher says that the main goal for all organisms is to survive and reproduce. We've done both and reached a population of over 7 billion people. But now we're starting to overthink things. Things like diversity, things like equality, things like preventing dis discrimination from occurring are, become, are becoming to be taken for granted and are not being assessed well enough. We use our sight to discriminate, our ears to make bias, our touch to act upon these, and our smell really just to serve ourselves. So now, I propose a solution, a panacea, if you will, for all global problems. We all go a month without any of our senses and live in our thoughts. Now, the journey to our thoughts, much like throughout our search history on Google, is a dark, twisty, windy path through months and months of mistakes. Mistakes built on the assumption that we as humans can do anything we want as long as they benefit the greatest amount of people, also known as utilitarianism. Utilitarianism itself is based on the concept of consequentialism. But how do we know if something has a good consequence? We don't know the future. We don't know how many, how many years it will take for benefit to arise from our actions. So for one month, the entire human population will sit in silence and think. Much like snow falling and collecting on the ground, collecting as one people, not looking us at us each as individuals that have conflicts, that have different varying ideas. We just 
look at the thoughts that we had these past years and ask ourselves, was school worth it? And move on. Madam Chair. Thank you, Speaker Seven. And two minutes for our judges. Speaker Six, if you had to lose one sense, sight, smell, hearing, touch, or taste, which would it be? Speaker Six. Vibrant colors, the taste of fresh strawberries, water lapping at your feet on the ocean. My mother's piano playing in the next room. Without our senses, we wouldn't be able to experience the amazing things in our world. But if I had to lose one of these valuable senses, the sense I would lose is the sense of smell. Now, Today, I'll be telling you why I would lose the sense of smell over the sense of sight, hear, touch, or taste. To start off with a sense of sight, everywhere we go, there are always new sights to see, whether you're out at Stanley Park or on the island or traveling to another country. There's so many different cultures to see, colors, movies, shows, so many different applications of our sight that I wouldn't want to lose that sense. Now, in terms of hearing and touch, we can see that during the COVID-19 pandemic, we haven't been able to be in contact with people. And for me, that means losing the ability to hug my loved ones, maybe even to talk with people who don't necessarily have access to the internet or a phone. And this severely impacted me because I lost the ability to communicate with a lot of the people that I used to see on a daily basis at school. So, in, so personally, I would not want to lose the sense of hearing or of touch. Now, lastly, taste. Taste is an integral part of Chinese culture. From our cultural foods like fish or even dumplings to our spices and sauces that are incorporated in our dishes, it's a part of my identity and it's a part of my family's identity and something that I would never want to lose. So that is why I would not choose the sense of taste as the sense I would lose. In a world as beautiful as ours, each sense is a, is a part of our experience of the world. Whether you're giving a hug to a loved one or being able to taste your favorite dish, each sense is part of our world experience. But if I had to lose a sense, I would lose the sense of smell. Thank you. Back to you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Speaker Six. And two minutes for our judges. I see Speaker Five. Speaker Five, if you had to lose one sense, sight, smell, hearing, touch, or taste, which would it be? Speaker five. We have five senses. Sight, smell, taste, hearing, and feel. If I had to lose one of those senses, it would be taste because I have horrible cooking. Just the other day, I was really, really hungry and no one was around to make me food. So I decided that I was gonna try and make pasta. Pasta, it seems like the easiest thing you can cook. You boil, you boil some water, put your pasta in, and mix your, mix your sauce. I thought it was the easiest meal to make. Apparently I was supposed to salt the water before I put the pasta in, but no one told me that. So my pasta tasted so, so bland. I boiled my water, put my pasta in, and stirred it around. And then I drained it and put my sauce in it, but it still tasted awful. And I had no idea what to do with it. So I just kept putting in more spices and herbs and whatever, and just kept tasting more awful. I also wouldn't need my take, my sense of taste because it isn't necessary. I can go a whole day without needing to taste anything as long as I continue to put food in my body, as long as I continue to fuel myself. So if I had to lose 
one sense, either sight, smell, feel, taste, or hearing, I would lose my sense of taste because I have horrible cooking and it isn't at all necessary. Back to you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Speaker. Five and two minutes for our judges, please. Speaker four, if you had to lose one sense, sight, smell, hearing, touch, or taste, which would it be? Speaker four. Hello, judges and fellow cadets. Today, my topic is if I had to lose one of my five senses, what would it be? You could say many things. There's touch, smell, sight, hearing, and taste. Many people have lost one or even more of these, but the most common that I know of is probably taste. You lose taste from getting sick, not having enough taste buds, maybe burning your tongue, maybe injuring your taste buds, but multiple of those things I have done before. I'm talking about burning my tongue. Yes, everybody does it. But if I were gonna lose one of those things, it's, it's hard to say. If first thing I was gonna knock off the list is sight. I don't wanna lose sight because I know what it, I've talked to people who are actually blind and I don't want to, I don't know if offense them, but I don't want to lose sight. I'd like to be able to see my friends and, and communicate them with my face and being able to see their facial expressions. I also don't want to lose my hearing because I want to be able to hear their voice. I want to be able to hear them and communicate with them properly. Net left is touch, smell, and taste. Taste, I don't necessarily need. If it's spicy, you wouldn't be able to tell it. Maybe then I'd enjoy eating spicy foods because you won't be able to taste them. It just tastes bland. Touch, that's one of the harder ones to lose because how would you, because if all your skin stopped working, I could go like this. I wouldn't feel anything. I could, I could literally stab myself and I'd lose feeling for touch. And I wouldn't know when I'm in pain. So that's a bad thing. So I'm gonna knock that one off the list as well. Left is taste and smell. Smell can be helpful at sometimes as well. Maybe if there's a gas leak outside, you'd be able to smell the rotten egg smell. So if I was gonna lose one of my five senses, I think I'm gonna lose taste because that one comes in the least amount of use to me. Thank you and back to you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Speaker Four. And two minutes for our judges. Speaker Three, if you had to lose one sense, sight, smell, hearing, touch, or taste, which will it be? Speaker Three. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, judges, officers, fellow cadets, and esteemed guests. I am Sergeant Patrick from the 396 City of Prince George, Royal Canadian Air Cadet Squadron. And if I had to lose any one of my senses, I would definitely lose my sense of smell. I wouldn't want to lose my sense of sight because it would impact my life too much. I use my sense of sight to get around, walking, running, and I'm clumsy enough as it is, running into walls and my desk as I walk past it, and I would definitely hurt myself a lot. I also use my sense of sight to read people's emotions, and I can't imagine not seeing my sister smile when I wake up in the morning. I wouldn't want to use, lose my sense of hearing because it would also impact my life too much. Music is a big part of my life, and I couldn't imagine losing the joy of not hearing my guitar as I strum its strings, or not being able to hear the other music that people create. Not having my sense of touch would also be hard, 
because I wouldn't be able to feel things like hugging my family or petting my cat. Losing my sense of taste would also be hard for me because I love to eat. I mean, who doesn't? So I would lose my sense of smell. That way, I wouldn't have to smell things like the pulp mill in Prince George. Nobody around here really likes that. In conclusion, I would lose my sense of smell because it wouldn't impact my life too much and I would get to avoid the things, the negative things that come along with my sense of smell. Thank you. Thank you, speaker three and two minutes for our judges. There you are, speaker two. If you had to lose one sense, sight, smell, hearing, touch, or taste, which will it be? Speaker two. As a human being, you have many gifted senses. You can see, smell, taste, touch, and hear. Now, in the case of losing one, to do so, we have to categorize and think, what is most important to a person? Smell, for instance. I love a beautiful summer day when I can walk outside in the dusk and smell the heat, see the beautiful vastness of where I live, the lake, the mountains, be able to touch trees, feel the grass, feel the warmth of the sun, and to hear the birds chirping, the water crashing against the pier. Now, what I don't see very much use in is taste. Back to the importance, smelling. It can be really important for yourself. Suppose you're going for that important job interview and you smell horrible, you can't tell. That's your neck there. You're not gonna get that job if you smell awful and you walk in. They're, they're gonna immediately say, holy moly, please take a step back for me, maybe in the corner of the room. Sight. If you're doing anything, math, uh, driving, flying, walking, it's gonna be a little difficult. I prefer to see. I really do prefer to see and do things that way. And I wouldn't prefer to walk around with a stick. So sight to me is very important. Touch, I work with my hands. I build rockets, I, I fly RC, I use computers often. I do all sorts of fantastic things. And so having my hands, having the ability to feel and touch and do all that sort of things, typing, working with them, screwing with screwdrivers, using power tools, other equipment, I need these things. I can't lose touch. I, I would, that would cost me my life. There we go, game over. And hearing, conversations. If I affect the speaking, if I want to communicate to you effectively, I'm going to need to be able to hear, to speak so I can hear myself. So that's why it's important. Now, taste also has a bit of a downside for me. I have allergies. So I wouldn't really be missing out. I, I don't need to taste everything because chances are it's not going to be good for me. You know, I might just, I love food, food might not love me. So I'm totally fine and missing out in that way. In any case, choosing to lose taste isn't a, detri a detriment to myself. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Speaker Two. And two minutes for our judges. Judges ready? Speaker One, if you had to lose one sense, sight, smell, hearing, touch or taste, which would it be? Speaker one. If I had to lose one of my senses, I would probably want to lose sight. And I know this isn't really a popular opinion because it isn't something that's easy to give up. And I know this because um, my grandma, um, she didn't get to choose what sense she was gonna lose. She lost her sight to um, type three diabetes. And growing up, I watched her whole demeanor change. And I watched all of her senses, the rest of her senses that she was forced to depend on become extremely enhanced. I watched her map out the entire house. I watched her map out all of the dials and the, 
the buttons on the phone so she could call her friends and talk to them. I watched her um, learn all the dials on the microwave, despite there not actually being any physical buttons. We had to use these little plastic um, bubbles, as we call them, plastic bubbles, and we'd stuck them on the microwave. And we only stuck it on the five. And from the five, she was able to punch in all the other numbers. Now, losing her sight didn't mean that she lost every aspect of her life. Yes, she couldn't go out on her own and things like that, but in a way, it changed her. It changed her memory. And to this day, she is the sharpest person I know. Her memory is ridiculously strong. She remembers anniversaries, death anniversaries, birthdays, anything, you name it, she knows it. She understands time, everything, she's got it. And I, I, as much as she tells me, I wish that I never lost my sight. I look at her and I think to myself, look at you. You are almost 80 and you are still able to do all this on your own by yourself. She lives in a care home now and all of the care workers go to her and love to talk to her because her mind is still so sharp. So to summarize, if, if I could lose any one of my senses, I think it would be sight. It's, it's quite the challenge and I think I'd be up to it. Back to you, Madam Chair. Thank you, speaker one and two minutes for our judges. Cadets, great job. All the speeches are concluded. Right now, I'm gonna conduct some cadet interviews. So let's have you rename yourself back to your rank and your name. All right, so speaker one, introduce yourself, tell us your rank, name, and squadron you're with. Hi everyone, uh, uh, my name is Flight Sergeant D'Souza. Um, my uh, squadron is 819 Skyhawk Squadron. <laughs> Great, nice to meet you, Flight Sergeant. Now, here's a different one. Musical instrument or sports? Uh, uh, it's kind of hard for me because I did do uh, music for three years in high school and um, I was also a bit of a, a track runner. <laughs> so um, if I had to really pick, I would probably say sports. I would, I, I would love to do that. <laughs> Great job. Outdoorsy. Uh, favorite dish or cuisine? Favorite dish. Yes. Cuisine. Um, my favorite dish is all is a it's a homemade dish that my mom makes. It's called a uh, biryani. Um, and she makes it differently from everybody else. And I I I won't eat anyone else's but hers. <laughs> <laughs> I think your mom will be very proud to hear you say that. Yeah. <laughs> So what I makes your that, so. oh, what makes your mom's <laughs> dish different from others? Um, there's like there's like all these little spices that are placed in to enhance like the taste. But thing is, is that when you're eating it, you end up having to pick it through and pull out all the spices separately. So you can't just down it all in one go. Ah, <laughs> so I guess it. I like my mom's because it's just you know it's easier to get down. <laughs> For sure. Now, um, here's one. What do you miss most? Uh, have you gone to summer camp, first of all? Yes, I have. Okay, what do you miss most of summer camp? Um, I went to basic survival. And I think what I miss the most was how we got, we got isolated from the rest of the, the rest of the, the summer camp group in Albert Head. And I, what I think about when I what I missed most was probably that whole that sense of almost family that we got there because at the end of it on our last day we were such a wreck like I I cannot describe how um awful it was feeling that we were, I was never going to see these people for in a really long time or maybe never at all it was it was such a wreck on the last day everyone was just crying or <laughs> but oh, um the experience was totally worth it so but I, I miss the people the most and I miss that For sense sure. of security. You, you definitely create a bond when you're in person mm -hmm. and friendships develop for sure. All right, let's go on, keep going with our uh, cadets interview. Speaker two, introduce yourself and the squadron you're with. 
I, I am one officer, second class, Jade Roster with 223 Red Lion and Vernon. Nice to meet you there, Warren Officer Second Class. More or less the same question, sports or musical instrument? Or your, your no, case is I've probably a... rockets, right? <laughs> <laughs> I wish. Um, uh, for myself, I've been part of the school band program, jazz band and choir for as long as I can remember. So I'm more orientated towards the band side of things. However, I, I do thoroughly enjoy sports. So this is kind of a hard choice for myself as well, but I'm going to have to side with the side of music in this uh, case. Good, good. To each their own, that is, right? Uh, teaching online. Uh, have you been teaching uh, the cadet levels online and have you encountered any challenges and how you overcome them? Yes, ma'am. Um, last, or this spring, turn the clock back, I taught part of the spring cap session. It was a lot of fun. You can probably guess the topic I was teaching, of course, <laughs> rockets. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so it was an absolute blast, pun intended. Um, the, the challenge teaching online is just trying to get the engagement. We we're glad to pull it off. We used a PowerPoint presentation to make sure all the cadets, you know, their eyes are glued in the screen. They're having fun with it. Uh, we got them to do an activity, build their own rocket. Ooh. Their little, an alka seltzer rocket, this tiny wow. little guy. So we got them all to build their own rockets and launch them off. And that was just the biggest thing for them. Uh, as a teacher, one of the things I get a lot of pride in is watching my cadets take on a challenge and then be able to do work with it, think of an idea of how to solve it, and then give it a shot and apply what they think and see how it goes. And so when it came to, to them building rockets, watching them develop and grow as they build and experiment with their own ideas, it's just a redeeming factor that makes it go, this is what it means to be a cadet, nonetheless staff. You know how I feel right now watching you folks present. It's uh, quite proud uh, uh, moment for myself here and having these competitions, watching you young people uh, do your speeches. But yes, what you were doing, it's definitely mind blowing. Sorry, pun intended too. <laughs> That's good. That's good. I like that. <laughs> All right. So we're going to move on to um, speaker three. Speaker three, introduce yourself and the squadron you're with. Hello, I'm Sergeant Patrick from the 396 RCAC squadron. Nice to meet you there, Sergeant Patrick. Now, um, hmm, what is the most funniest thing that you've encountered at FTXs? I'm not sure. There's been some pretty interesting things at FTXs. Uh, you can come back to it. Here's another question. At FTXs, what are the weirdest combinations of MREs have you tried? I would have to say at the end of FTXs, when we just have all the leftover MREs, and so they're throwing together the breakfast and like dinner and lunch packages. And so for breakfast, you're eating like beans and pop tarts. So it's a pretty interesting combination. What is your favorite? <laughs> My favorite MRE? I would have to say breakfast, just having pop tarts. Just pop tarts. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't their milkshakes pretty good too? I don't usually have them. Oh, okay. Because I know that the crackers are like cardboard, but the peanut butter is pretty good. I don't mind the crackers. I oh. mean, a lot of people don't like them, but... <laughs> Okay. Um, have you earned any other pins during your time with cadets, like with other activities? Yeah, I do the Duke of Edinburgh, so I have my bronze. Oh, bravo. Good job there. And uh, again, in musical instrument or outdoor sports? That is also a hard one for me because mm. I have been playing the guitar since I was seven. And I've been doing band since I was in grade five. And I've been doing track and field and cross country since I was in grade two. 
So for me, they're pretty even. I don't know. I think, uh, that's, that's okay. And I think a lot of our cadets with us right now are very well-rounded and they uh, incorporate a very uh, uh, many things in their lives and they keep very busy. So thank you very much, Sergeant. Next, I'd like to have a uh, speaker four introduce themselves and the squadron you're with. Hello, I am AC Hill from the 279 Elk Valley Squadron. Welcome, AC Hill. So, uh, instrument, musical instrument or outdoor sports? It's hard to say because personally, I love um, playing my flute, which I started the uh, started grade six when I came to high school. But I love sports, even though no muscle. <laughs> uh, but if I were going to choose between them, I'd definitely choose um, band because I feel like that's something I'm more interested in than sports. Okay. And AC, you're you're uh, the first year with cadets or second? Uh, this would be my first year. First year with cadets. And the first year you're already uh, on virtual platforms. Are you, is that correct? Yeah. <laughs> and I hope your school is, is in person still. Yeah, we're in person with our school. And just this Thursday, we actually got to go back to in-person cadets. Oh, okay. That's fantastic to be able to bond and see uh, fellow cadets uh, again and be able to, to not shake their hand, but at least <laughs> they're in the same building as you, for sure. Uh, favorite dish or cuisine that you like? It's hard to say. I love so many dishes, but I'm also a very picky eater. Oh. So if I was gonna choose a very, if I was, I can't talk today. If I was gonna choose a favorite cuisine, you know, I'd definitely go, um, the, I forget what it's called. I, oh, it's the sockeye salmon sushi from Sushi Wood. It's, I just, oh. whenever we go there, I order about four plates of it and it's still not enough. <laughs> sockeye salmon is quite delicious and you're lucky that you live on the, on the coast here. The Pacific has the, uh, some really good sockeye salmon. <laughs> oh, I don't even live on the coast. Um, we're like pretty much in Alberta. Like, oh, that's right. You are, uh, you're inland. That's right. Yeah. Well, you're still in BC. You'll, you'll get access to it one way or the other. Uh, so let's see. Uh, tell us about the most funniest online classroom experience you've encountered. Ooh, so many to choose from. Um, if, could I say one from cadets? Of course. So um, we had one from our squadron and I think it was just a practice one. And it was, um, describe the weirdest dream you've had. And there's so there was a whole bunch of different answers, but one of my favorites was um, one of them, they kept on falling, the, you know, the falling dream where you were always falling, but then they hit the ground, but they, but they didn't, they didn't feel pain. They just got up. And they kept on walking and then they started falling again and it just and just rotated for the loop over and over again and they oh, just goodness. did that for like three minutes it was really funny constant <laughs> yeah i don't like that dream of falling off the bed <laughs> there it's it's not a not a fun dream for me all right thank you so moving on to our i believe i am up to speaker six. Oh, five. speaker five introduce yourself and the squadron you're with thank you very much ac uh, I'm LAC Sandy Catterney, and I'm from the 8481 Road Squadron on Bank of Toronto. Welcome. Thank you, LAC, for joining us. That makes you the, the youngest one with us. Is that correct? I think Asa Hill might be younger than me, but still in the same grade. Ah, uh, for sure. Well, it is very nice to see the young people participating at the Effective Speaking Program uh, at such an early stage in their um, cadet career. Now, musical instrument or outdoor sports? Well, I think it's kind of a tie for me. I've been playing soccer since I was five years old and started piano at around six years old. So Ooh. I've been doing, and I, I started 
was playing the alto saxophone in grade six and joined gymnastics when I was around seven years old. So I've been doing kind of equal in both areas. I don't, yeah, I don't think I can really pick between sports. <laughs> Which or, is okay. It's bravo yeah. that you're quite well-rounded that way there. Uh, let's see, a favorite dish? Or um, I'd have to say any any Indian food my mom makes. I, yeah, I, I, I is don't mom in the background? <laughs> uh, no, my mom's upstairs. But she's on the mom, meeting. Mom yeah. will be very proud. <laughs> yeah. I think our cadets really do like our mom's food. That's great there. Uh, let's see. Um, now, I think I remember you're on, you're in class uh, teach uh, schooling now. Is that correct? That's uh, what, going to school? great uh and what is your favorite course subject Ooh, i'd have to say probably social studies or like math or something like that oh okay social studies yeah. or math very good and uh here's something out of the blue tofu or paneer i've only actually ever had <laughs> tofu once in my life and it was at a friend's house i don't okay. pick paneer just because i've had it more than tofu, you're more familiar with paneer yeah. yeah it looks the same taste is totally different yeah <laughs> great thank you very much lac and we are on to speaker six speaker six introduce yourself and the squadron you're with Hello, my name is Flight Sergeant Quinn. I'm from 637 Aero in Burnaby, and it's great to meet everyone. Nice to meet you, Flight Sergeant Quinn. Now, um, favorite dish? Ooh, favorite dish. Mm. It could go very specific, too. Oh, I got to say, uh, pretty similar to everyone else, I'd have to go my parents cooking. Just... Oh, is your parents back there for some reason? <laughs> oh, no, they're in a different room. But yeah, no, Our I parents. think, yeah, I, I like homemade food, so. Oh, good. Any, anything specific? Oh, well. Spare ribs, hard to choose, eggplant, yeah. chili. I don't know if I can choose, honestly, but. Um, On your daddy... birthday, what would you want your mom to make most for you? Uh, I gotta say my dad makes pretty good fish, so. Yeah. So you're going with your dad, mm -hmm. your dad's fish. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> good call. Cover them both there, right? <laughs> now, Flight Sergeant, uh, have you gone to um, summer camps or FTXs? Yes, I have, ma'am. All right. So what do you miss most about the summer camps? So two years ago, I believe, I went to Advanced Aerospace in Quebec, Saint-Jean, and it was like one of the best cadet experiences I've had in my whole career. It was just amazing meeting people from all over Canada and being able to partake in the activities there. So like if anyone is thinking of applying for a summer camp, I highly recommend Advanced Aerospace. You get to do so many cool things like scuba diving in a pool, building rockets. So yeah, definitely a really great experience. Great job. Thank you for sharing. And I love it, the fact that you're uh, encouraging the younger uh, cadets to sign up for those summer camps because they are a very good experience for them uh, to meet new friends, uh, learn new things, and also discover uh, our uh, Canada for sure. Just like you, you were able to head over to Quebec um, and have those great experiences there. Okay the weirdest MRE combination then? Ooh, weirdest MRE? Hmm. You could do it, spit it out. <laughs> oh, I, I gotta think. Um, I think the weirdest has got to be, my friend once tried putting jam on like the, uh, the apple, I, I forgot what meat it is, but it's like a, a patty like an apple one and they put cham on it and ate it like toast in for breakfast because we oh. didn't have any more of the bread so yeah i think that must have been pretty weird well he got his protein that's for sure is that yeah. right and he had to sweeten it up with some jam <laughs> that's quite interesting all right and have you uh 
any other any pins uh, from other activities that you can tell us about? Yeah, I also have my Duke of Ed. So uh, currently working on my silver, but because of COVID, the like journeys have been a little delayed. So yeah, mm. I do have my bronze. And you're keeping a record of all the activities. Yeah. Is that is that harder now, like regarding Duke of Ed? Uh, in terms of like actually doing the activities, it is a bit harder, but for recording, they've moved to their online record book. So instead of having to do it by hand and send in your package, it's all online. So that makes things a lot quicker. So for cadets, if you are interested in that Duke of Edinburgh, go online and uh, submit uh, those uh, records of your uh, activities. It's so easy right now. Um, but due to COVID, definitely some of those, uh, like, um, like Sergeant Quinn said, that the journeys are the one thing that may be delaying you from accomplishing it, but it should be easier for sure. Okay, thank you very much, Flight Sergeant Quinn. And we are on to Speaker 7. Speaker 7, introduce yourself and the squadron that you are with. Uh, hello, my name is Flight Corporal Rabadon, and I'm part of 583 Coronation Squadron. Welcome, Flight Corporal. Thank you for joining us today here. Now, uh, let's see, Flight Corporal, have you been teaching online or uh, receiving uh, instructions online? Uh, at the squadron, yeah, it's all yes. been online. So what is the most funniest thing that has happened in those virtual classrooms that you can divulge to us in this in, in this setting? <laughs> um, I was teaching a class of uh, level ones and it was the phonetic alphabet, radio communications. Uh, let's just say that I don't think they assumed I could read their code that quickly in the chat. Oh, so you were able to decipher their messages pretty quick, okay? It was an interesting chat. Let's leave it at that. <laughs> All right, sounds good. Uh, your favorite dish or cuisine? Uh, I'd have to say it would be um, a traditional dish in my culture called uh, rishda. It's it's like our style of noodles um you can't really describe it it's a it's a totally different flavor it's amazing all right and what ethnicity is that uh, i might want to go try it is it available in restaurants uh, or do i have I, to come to your house it. and have your mom cook for us probably the case <laughs> um it's literally <laughs> okay i will send you an email with my uh address and or I will come to your address and I will have mom cook for me. How's that? <laughs> for sure. Thank you. Now, um, have you other pins or activities that you have accomplished that you tell us about? Um, unfortunately, I joined cadets at a point where we were, uh, I joined a little late, so we were really ramping up to go into quarantine at that time. Uh, oh, but I goodness. do have outside of cadet activities. Um, yeah, um, Duke great. of Edinburgh being one of them. Uh, there's one more. Yeah. I know you're, you're participating in something national, are you not? Do you want to share about that? True. Uh, <laughs> I have a... Um, national debate tournament going on right now so i have to go to that in like a few minutes oh but yeah. okay all right well thank you and good luck to you in that national <laughs> debate competition there all right i wanted to thank you for joining uh, to being part thank of you. our competition as well but i know you are also in something uh, another competition as well so thank you very much flight corporal we're moving on to speaker eight speaker eight uh, introduce yourself and the squadron you're with. Hi, my name is Matthew Douglas. I'm a Warrant Officer Second Class, and I'm from 858 Skookum Chuck Squadron on the Sunshine Coast. Welcome, Warrant Officer Second Class Douglas. All right, so uh, musical instrument or sports? Ma'am, I'm sorry, but you're asking me to choose my favorite parent, and I'm not really <laughs> sure. My, my dad used to be um, a parry officer in the military. And my mom is a band teacher. 
Um, so Shh. I'm playing piano Don't and singing pick. and all that yeah. stuff since Both, for a right? very long time. And my my dad and I, we do a ton of stuff. Like about, I don't know, 20 minutes before I, I came onto the Zoom, my dad and I, to relieve my stress, I was out playing pickleball. Um, so it's fabulous. I don't want to, I don't really want to choose one because I love both my parents so much and I want them to feel the same way about me. Of course. And it is as it is. It should be great answer there. Warren officer second class, but of course, jokes aside, our parents are very valuable. We love them both and uh, they love you as well. Now, uh, being a warrant officer second class, you must have some stories from some summer camps or FTXs to share with us. Um, well, I, I've, I've, I went to, I've been to a couple camps. I'm a bandy, so I've been to basic band, I've been to GT, and more recently I've been to advanced band, and that was a lot of fun. I spent, that was, I spent a lot of time reading there, but I think my best story, or I don't know, when it comes to online, it was more recently online, and this was when, um, I was at this this level five workshop and we were all having to make a picture board about every like about what we found to be interesting what we found to be motivating and like what were the good values of a good leader and most people did theirs on time some people had to like really scramble and make something to get like at last second but there was one really last second entry that really took the cake in my opinion and it was of this person that made their entire board of just wizard pictures. They, they couldn't find anything online. They just had to use the things they had stored on their computer. So they had a picture of a wizard and that's supposed to be the knowledge of a leader. I, I, they ha I, I can't explain it because it was so out there and it was so creative. And it was, I couldn't tell if it was embarrassing for the person who was doing it or like to be really amazed by how crafty they were in their last couple seconds of, I don't know, putting it together. Oh, that's probably my, my favorite story. That's great. And I think they they thank you for thinking that they were amazing and putting some things so, together in such last minute there. So uh, that is our, oh, actually, I have one more for you, Warren Officer Seclas Seclas. Uh, who cooks better, mom or dad? <laughs> thank you very much, ma'am. All right. So I am going to go on to our judges interviews. Now I'd like to introduce to you all our three judges uh, for this competition. We have present uh, Ms. Uh, Warrant Officer Gordon Carey, and I'm going to read the biographies of uh, Warrant Officer uh, Carey. Originally enlisted in the CAF in 1986 as a radio technician with assignments to 1st Canadian Signals Regiment in Kingston, Ontario, followed by the Government Emergency Bunker at CFS CARP, just outside Ottawa. I left the military at the end of 1994 to pursue my education, earning a diploma of electronics engineering technology from BCIT. After working in the high-tech sector in Vancouver for a number of years, I chose to return to the CAF in 2003, this time as an avionics systems technician in the Air Force. Following training and a short assignment to CFB Shearwater, Nova Scotia, I was reassigned to 443 Maritime Helicopter Squadron in Victoria, where I spent 14 years maintaining the CH-124 Sea King, followed by the CH-148 Cyclone. Upon my promotion to Warrant Officer in 2019 and a reclassification to Air Maintenance Superintendent, I was transferred to Region Cadet Support Unit in Vancouver to be a training support coordinator for the cadet units in the Lower Mainland. During my entire career, I have been deployed four times. Baghdad, Iraq in 1988, Golan Heights, Israel, 1990, CFS Alert, 1994, Libya as part of a helicopter air detachment aboard HMCS Vancouver in 2011 to 2012. Thank you very much, 
Warren Officer Carey for attending and helping us out at this competition. And I'd like to give you an opportunity to share a few words with our cadets. Uh, well, thank you for that uh, uh, introduction, the opportunity to be here and participate in this. Um, so for the cadets, uh, well done to everyone. Um, I know the, the level of uh, dedication it takes just to stay calm in these things. Um, and I had mentioned to the other judges and staff uh, earlier before you joined us that even when I was a cadet uh, 40 years ago, um, the subject of effective speaking was one of the main pillars of the cadet program. Models may change, units may change, personnel will obviously rotate through, but at its core, even when it was first established in 1941, uh, the cadets have tried very uh, successfully, I think, but they've tried very hard to instill certain uh, aspects. And one of them has always been the, the ability to communicate clearly, effectively. And this effective speaking program is a continuation of what was done for many decades before. And I congratulate you all for having uh, not only the ability to speak clearly and calmly, but the courage to do it. Because of all the great things that we go through in our life, besides having children and getting married and moving, one of the greatest fears many people have is getting up in front of people and speaking. To see you guys do this at an early age and do it with with uh, your professionalism was a great thing to see. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Warren Officer Carey there. Next, I'd like to introduce to you, Mr. Tom Jones, Distinguished Toastmasters, M-A-O-M-M-P-A. -M -M Mr. Jones is a management and communications consultant specializing in the fields of general management, communication, and real estate investment. Mr. Jones has earned two master's degree in the field of organizational management and public administration, respectively. He has served on the board of directors for several organizations and volunteers his time within his community, providing service to help the disenfranchised and uh, marginalized. Uh, he teaches presentation skills and consults with entrepreneurs and small business owners on how to start or grow their businesses. A dedicated Toastmaster for 16 years and a member of Unicorn Tribe Toastmasters Club. He has held a number of high profile leadership positions within Toastmasters and has attained the distinguished Toastmasters designation, the highest level of educational achievement in the organization. Mr. Joan loves Toastmasters and all things Toastmasters. Mr. Jones served on the Toastmasters International Board of Directors from 2013 to 2015 and continues to serve as a working ambassador for the organization. He was instrumental in helping to develop and support the policies and procedures that guided Toastmasters International in fulfilling its mission. He says Toastmasters has inspired me to become a more compassionate human being and leader. And ask about his life's greatest accomplishments, he would say simply state, surviving self and helping others to learn the skills to do the same. Thank you, Mr. Jones. And a moment for you to have a few words for our uh, contestants. Wow, thank you very much for having me here today uh, to serve as a judge for this very honorable event. Um, for me, communication and leadership are one and the same. And what I've witnessed here today are the future leaders of our country. Uh, I know that your parents are proud of you. I don't even know you and I'm proud of you for what I've witnessed here today. Uh, to each of you, first know that you're all winners. There are no losers. You know, should you continue your journey through communications, there's no limits to what you can achieve. I don't have any regrets about my life, but if there was one, it would have been to have started with communications training when I was young. 
because I didn't start. I was always a good talker, but I was not a good communicator. And so as an ambassador for Toastmasters International, I share around the world with people about the important, it doesn't matter what you do, communications is a key and the difference. You will always rise if you are a good communicator. So to each of you, cadets, what I've witnessed here today has touched my heart. And I say to you, stay the course. Back to you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, Mr. Jones, for your kind words. Next, I would like to introduce to you, Ms. Lori Cullerman. Ms. Cullerman had been a college instructor at Langara since 2004, teaching business communication courses, including public speaking. She has held memberships in Toastmasters a total of 14 years, won several speech contests, and delivered over 300 presentations to the general public in her former career as a student advisor. Prior to teaching, Ms. Coleman wrote many published articles, guides, and procedure manuals. And her writing experience now includes current work on both fiction and nonfiction books. She also enjoys many volunteer opportunities, such as her recent time as a member of the Editorial Advisory Committee for People's Talk mag Magazine uh, for Human Resource Professionals. So thank you very much, Ms. Cullerman, for participating at this competition. And I'd like to uh, give you the floor to have a few words for our Thank you. Um, uh, thank you very much for that uh, uh, introduction. Uh, first, I want to say to the students, congratulations on um, stepping up and doing an excellent job uh, in a unusual kind of circumstance with it being online in particular, um, but also just with public speaking. Most people do not choose to do public speaking. Some people may um, pursue public speaking training because they have no other choice. Um, so I applaud you in your efforts. I applaud your bravery, your courage. Um, and, and I really appreciate what you shared today about your thoughts and feelings and experiences. Uh, I also want to say that uh, this skill that you are practicing now of public speaking uh, is, a, is a skill that gives you confidence uh, and, and and courage for other things in the future and is something that will make any career a um, open and better option for you. I could never have imagined when I was in high school that I would someday be teaching college because I was incredibly shy. Once I got into public speaking training, I started building confidence and could soon talk to anyone, anytime, anywhere, including job um, including at job interviews. I think job interviews are easy and fun, but if you ask most people, they find them nerve wracking. So I'm just going to give you this tip right now. I encourage you to continue to pursue public speaking training for many years to come. Never stop. If you don't use it, you lose it. It's just like working out at the gym, building your muscles. If you don't use it, you lose it. Uh, so I would encourage you to continue your training and practice always. Uh, it will also give you an advantage in any future career you might choose because most people run from this stuff. Most people give into the fear. They don't want to go through all the nerve wracking feelings of it. And so they, they don't pursue it. So uh, whereas if you do leadership, management, entrepreneurship, um, even if you want to pursue a career in acting, like anything that you want to do that requires that courage, you are building and training that um, uh, courage muscle, right? The confidence muscle. And so it really opens things up. So I can't say that enough because um, much like Tom, I got started a bit later in my life and wished I had had this earlier. If it was up to me, I'd make this kind of public speaking experience and training and competition mandatory and all high school education. All right, so enough for my speech. <laughs> Thank you very much for the honor of being able to participate as a judge. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Collerman, for your words there for our cadets then. 
Now, we have our results, and I think I've held you in suspense uh, quite a bit, but I do have some slides that I would like to share. But before I start that, since we've already introduced our judges, I'll trouble our judges to rename themselves back to their name, please. And uh, Timer and Tally people, can I also have you to rename yourself back to your name? Our timer today is Miss Erica Lee. And we have tally people, uh, our tellers are Miss Jennifer So and also Captain Colosi. didn't work as perfect as I thought it would. There was supposed to be music and you know, automatic suicide. Well, practice makes perfect, as we all say. So next time. <laughs> now, we are in a position to announce our uh, awards now, but I would like to call upon Ms. Terry Hinton, our BCPC president, to share some comments and then following will be the award slides. Ms. Terry Hinton? I just want to thank you all for giving us your gift of your speech, cadets. It's been an unusual year for effective speaking across the country. And um, we've done it so differently and it's turned out so well. And thank you for adapting to our unusual times. And having looked at all those slides, uh, that Jermaine just showed us, it shows you how many people 
that are involved, not just the cadets, but the volunteers and the judges in, in the background. And um, I'm so thankful that you, you guys are all here and all practicing your speaking. And I suppose we should start, or do you want to hold them off longer? <laughs> I think they're on their edge of their seats. So Ms. Catherine Chack, if you have the slides ready. I'd like to announce the bronze goes to, L, oops, do I say the name yet? <laughs> yes. LAC Ready is our bronze winner, congratulations. In real, in usual times, I would be there putting the medal over your head and shaking your hand and giving your your pin. But in another time, we'll do that. And it's LAC Sabni Ready Kataretti. Yes. Question: Did your brother used to compete as well? Yes, I thought yes, it recognized. I thought it recognized the family name. It's kind of neat that when the comp uh, competitors follow along on, on their siblings. Sorry, squirrel moment, I went off to the side. And our next will be the silver. When the slide changes. <laughs> and that is Flight Corporal Ramadan from 583, congratulations. Well done, well done all of you. Oop, we're back to bronze. <laughs> okay, there we go, that's right. <laughs> well done. And for the big moment and for the name on the engraved provincial committee. Uh, Simulation class? drum roll. <laughs> yes, truly a drum roll. And the gold medal goes to W02 Matthew Douglas. Congratulations. Ah, and there's the plaque. Thank you, Ms. Hinton, for the announcements. Fantastic. Our medalists have been announced and they will be receiving the uh, Nancy E. Sangaris Award plaque engraved onto uh, their names engraved onto that plaque right there. And the following slide will indicate uh, the National Effective Speaking Competition date is June 5th um, on Zoom, but the details will be following and uh, I will be sending out uh, information regarding that to our uh, medalists uh, in a future date. So one more thing, uh, please be aware, we will be mailing out a silver pins to all the participants and the certificate of excellence with your evaluations from our judges as soon as possible. I thank our judges and a gift will be coming to you as well in the mail um, in, in, the, in the future dates there. Our appreciation goes to our coaches, our coordinators, officers, judges, parents, and to all the host squadrons at wing level, their volunteers and the cadets that participate at that level for making this year's virtual effective speaking competition such a success. Our gratitude goes out to BCPC for their paramount support in this uh, program alone. So thank you everyone for attending and supporting this great program. Congratulations to all our participants, our participants at this uh, provincial level today. Uh, I also like to thank our attendees. We have uh, Mr. Doug Slowski uh, attended. Many of our league reps are present and board of directors. And again, uh, we have Ms. Uh, Terry Hinton, our president of BCPC here with us. So this concludes our 2021 virtual BC Provincial Effective Speaking Competition. Thank you, and I hope you've enjoyed this competition and have the great rest of the afternoon.